Hello, my name is Danny Allwood, and this video is going to give you a very brief overview of NMR spectroscopy. So, what is NMR? Well, N stands for nuclear, and we're looking at the nuclei of the atoms in our molecule. The M stands for magnetic. We're going to place our molecule in a very strong magnetic field, and the nuclei in our molecule are going to respond to that magnetic field by behaving a little bit like little magnets themselves. And the R stands for resonance. And to understand resonance, we need to have a look at what spectroscopy means. So spectroscopy is the interaction of electromagnetic waves with matter. And in the case of NMR spectroscopy, we're going to use radio frequency electromagnetic waves to interact with the nuclei in our molecules. And we're going to be able to measure the response of the nuclei as a signal, which is our NMR spectrum. So this is one of our NMR spectrometers here at Sheffield Hallam University. And the main body of the spectrometer is here. And this is what houses most of the workings. Uh, but most interestingly, the point on the top, which you can see in red, is called the borehole, and that's where the sample gets dropped into the spectrometer. The samples are loaded from an automatic sample changer, which is all of this apparatus at the top. And you'll also notice on the floor that there are magnetic field safety barriers because the instrument generates a very strong magnetic field. Inside the instrument, you'll see that the borehole runs all the way through. And in the core of the instrument is a superconducting magnet. And for a magnet to be superconducting, it needs to be kept very cold. And that's why it's in a bath of liquid helium, which is surrounded by a jacket of liquid nitrogen. In the middle of the superconducting magnet, you have the radio frequency emitter and the signal detection coils, which are going to emit radio frequency electromagnetic waves and then detect the response from our nuclei in our molecule. So when the instrument loads a sample into the machine, it will drop down like this, so that the sample is in the middle of these emitter and detection coils in the middle of the magnet. To actually run an NMR spectrum, first we'll need an NMR tube, and this is basically a very long, thin glass test tube. We load our sample in there, we can see it as a powder. You generally only need about 10 milligrams. And then we use a deuterated solvent. So this is a solvent where all of the proton uh, nuclei have been replaced with deuterium, because deuterium doesn't show up in proton NMR spectrum. Uh, if we use protic solvent, we just see a big solvent signal, and we wouldn't actually see any of our sample. We're putting the solvent in the tube now, and then just making sure that all of our sample is fully dissolved. And then we put a cap on the tube like that, and the sample is now ready to run. So the first thing we need is a spinner. So this is basically a sample holder that's going to allow the sample to spin. And you place the sample tube into the spinner. You then get a depth gauge and you press the spinner and the sample tube into it to ensure that the sample's at the right height so that it's sitting in the middle of those coils that we saw in the previous diagram. We then place it onto the auto sampler and then we go to the computer to run our spectrum. So the auto sampler will move to our uh, sample. Um, just sped this part of the video up because otherwise it takes a long time. And once it reaches our sample, the robot arm at the top will come down and pick it up. It will then move it across to where the borehole is, and that's the part in red at the top of the spectrometer, and lower it into the borehole, where it will drop down into the centre of the magnet to actually run our spectrum. And after a couple of minutes on the computer, we'll get our proton NMR spectrum. So the most common type of NMR spectroscopy is probably proton NMR spectroscopy, which is hydrogen nucleus. And each proton NMR spectrum can tell us four pieces of data. Firstly, how many different types of proton nuclei there are in the molecule, and these are called chemical environments. So in this molecule here, we have one, two, three, four, five chemical environments, five different types of proton nuclei. So if you have five chemical environments in your molecule, you should see five signals in your NMR spectrum. And we can see that one, two, three, four, five. The second piece of data a proton NMR spectrum can tell us is the amount of electron density around each type of proton. And this is measured in chemical shift, which you can see on the x-axis at the bottom of the spectrum. The further left you go on the spectrum, the less electron density is around those proton nuclei. And this is an effect called de-shielding. Whereas the further right you go on the spectrum, there's more electron density around the, the protons. And this is known as shielding. So if we look at our molecule, um, anywhere we've got an electronegative element, such as oxygen, that's going to pull electron density away from the protons around it. So these two oxygen atoms in the molecule here are pulling electron density away from positions 1 and 4, and you can see that they are relatively de-shielded, or further left on the spectrum, compared to position 5. 
The other thing that deshields uh, nuclei very strongly is benzene rings, and we have one here. So positions two and three, which are directly attached to the benzene ring, will go very far left on the spectrum, very high chemical shift, because this is deshielding. Protons 5, on the other hand, are quite far away from both the oxygens and the benzene ring, so it goes further right on the spectrum, um, and this is quite heavily shielded. The third piece of data a proton MR spectrum can tell us is the number of protons which went into making each signal, and this is called integration or the integrated trace. So you'll see this overlaid on top of the spectrum, usually like this, as S curves in a different color, and the ratio of the heights of the S curves tells you how many protons went into making each signal. So you can see from these ones that it's a 2 to 2 to 3 to 2 to 3 ratio. Um, so you can use this in helping you identify which signals come from which chemical environments. The fourth piece of data that a proton NMR spectrum can tell us is which different proton nuclei are close together in the molecule. And the effect that you'll see here is coupling, and that's where the signal splits into multiple peaks. So if we look as an example at the signal for proton 4, uh, if we zoom in we can see that this is made up of four peaks, and this is called a quartet. So the reason for this is that the protons on position 4 are coupling to the adjacent protons on position 5. And if the protons on position 5 weren't there, the signal for proton 4 would be a singlet, because it wouldn't be coupling to anything. And you can see this in the spectrum, actually. So proton 1 is a singlet because there are no protons nearby that it can couple to. But in the case of proton 4, it's going to couple to the three protons on position 5. And every proton you couple to splits your signal by another peak. So coupling to one proton gives you a doublet, coupling to two protons gives you a triplet, coupling to three protons gives you a quartet. So this is why the signal for position 4 appears as a quartet. To use another example and look at position 5, if we zoom in on this we can see that it's a triplet, it's made up of three peaks, and this is because the protons at position 5 are coupling to the two protons at position 4. So your singlet splits into a doublet and then a triplet. So I hope you found that video interesting. Uh, if you'd like to see more videos about NMR, follow the link on the screen. That'll take you to my YouTube channel, where I've recorded a series of videos about various aspects of NMR spectroscopy. Uh, in the meantime, thank you very much for watching.